talk. My name is Rebecca Spooner, the Cultural Heritage Curator for the National Trust um, in South Wales. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about working with rural collections. So our rural collections encompass buildings, um, domestic and functional uh, land, machinery, transport, tools, textiles, craft, photography, archives, probably more than I've listed there. Um, currently, the rural collections are quite widely dispersed across Wales and without consistent interpretation presentation. So um, that's something that kind of quite interests me about our rural collections and um, how we manage them and, and uh, value them in the Trust. So I um, cover South Wales. I, I'm based at home in Abergavenny in beautiful Black Mountains in the southeast of Wales, um, but I travel across right over west to Pembrokeshire and as far north as Powers Castle in um, mid Wales. So that's it's quite a big patch um, for me. It's really interesting. I was saying to Rachel, I, so I work from home two or three days a week and then I'm out and about traveling um, to support the different um, properties and places um, uh, the rest of the week, which is a really nice balance. So I cover about eight properties and um, several outdoor places, including the Brecon Beacons and, and the Gower. So it's a very varied role, um, very much a generalist role. Um, so supporting um, collections, programming, presentation, interpretation and project management. So um, I really don't have any specialist knowledge of what I'm going to talk to you about at all. Um, I'm reliant on a lot of other people for that, but I'm um, really interested in our work with rural collections. Um, I think it's perhaps a slightly, um, not intentional, but a, a slightly undervalued area. Um, and I think our, our, our larger properties um, mansions can take up a lot of the limelight. Um, so I'm really interested um, in this work as a refreshing kind of counterpoint to all of that, really. Um, and my background's in the visual arts, um, but we're always working in rural environments. And um, I started at the Trust um, inauspiciously on the first day of lockdown in 2020 and was swiftly furloughed for eight months. So it was quite an unusual start, um, but I'm uh, slowly finding my feet now and learning a lot on the way. Um, so it's never a dull moment. So I'm going to introduce some um, three kind of recent case studies or examples um, um, that illustrate some of the activity and discussion of themes that I've found interesting as a new member of staff working with the Trust's rural collections. Um, but I'm sure a lot of these things are, will be very familiar to all of those of you that are well practiced in this field of work. So I just wanted to give you a little um, brief overview of National Trust Cymru and uh, Rachel and I were discussing this at, um, before um, you joined us about the distinction between the National Trust in Wales, National Trust Scotland and the broader National Trust. And I, Although National Trust Cymru is not a separate organisation to the National Trust by any means. I think there is a need in Wales to differentiate um, and um, kind of highlight the uh, unique Welsh context that we're operating in. And um, I think that, you know, the National Trust is seen as a very English organisation. Um, so kind of refining what that looks like when it's when we're operating in Wales. And especially the, the bilingual um, context and um, uh, political devolution. So just a, f a few kind of like facts there around um, uh, the trust in Wales. And I would say that link at the, the bottom of the um, text box there um, is, is really good, actually. It um, um, explains a lot more about farming in Wales and lots of information in there about how we work with um, tenant farmers as well. So I would kind of encourage you to um, take a look at that. I'm going to move on and talk about um, our first little case study. So this is the rethatching of Aberdeenant Cottage. So as it says there, a rare survival of a traditional Welsh farm in Carmarthenshire. Um, Aberdeen is grade two listed and was acquired by the Trust in 1996. It continues to be farmed by a tenant family. Um, and the main, so the main farmhouse is likely to be 400 years old and is viewable by appointment only. Um, and I've got a lovely description of it here um, from 1992 by the curator of St Fagan's National uh, Museum of History in Cardiff says an unflawed gem of an archaic vernacular Carmarthenshire farmhouse in an unspoilt landscape setting. 
which I thought was rather nice. Um, so a real testament to four centuries of Welsh rural life in Carmarthenshire. Um, the walls are of clay and stone rendered in lime wash under a thatched roof cov covered by corrugated iron from the 1920s to 1997, which I believe was common practice in, in Carmarthenshire to protect um, the roofs. Perhaps not, not the most aesthetically pleasing example, but it has got its own charm. Um, the National Trust renewed the thatch in 1997. So this is the kind of interesting bit that, uh, you know, conversations were happening about this when I first started at the Trust um, a couple of years ago. So a building inspection was carried out in December 2020 due to ongoing concerns about the condition of the roof thatch and the internal living conditions for the tenants. And a temporary roof cover was installed to provide temporary protection to the thatch. You can probably see some of that, the scaffolding um, over the roof. It's quite spectacular. Um, and a, um, a, what was described as a rich and lively discussion followed, um, supported by information gathered from independent thatchers regarding the merits of totally rethatching or providing a new corrugated tin roof. Um, it was a really interesting discussion that I felt kind of um, uh, landed in as a, as a new member of staff. And um, on the right here, you can see some of those discussion points. And I just found this a really interesting um, first example for me, really, about an experience of collecting collective decision making around how we um, consider and treat our um, vernacular buildings. Um, there's a lot of negotiating and influencing and advising involved, kind of developing a case study for support. So some of these discussion points did include, oops, sorry, let's go back. Um, priority of care for the tenant family was of the utmost because of the damp conditions in the house due to the deterioration of the thatch was, um, there were health concerns there. So that was absolutely number one top priority. Um, and then kind of uh, looking at the different materials, the supply of thatch, um, and the um, limited number of thatchers that we work with. Luckily, we did manage to find an amazing thatcher, Welsh-speaking thatcher who worked in um, Pembrokeshire, who's incredible. Well, I think one of the um, discussion points here that I found most interesting was about the indirect responsibility for the Trust to maintain heritage skills as well as heritage buildings. Um, and I think that was one of the arguments why we um, Curatorially, we wanted to make the argument to completely rethatch, and again, the rarity of um, the building and the historical significance of the building for Wales um, went into that recommendation. Luckily, that recommendation was passed, and the trust invested in um, thatching the whole roof. And I've got some amazing images um, that the team kind of commissioned, especially by the photographer Heather Burney. Um, so I can share those with the Royal Museums Network, actually. Um, but there's some amazing uh, pictures of the Thatcher in practice. So I, I just found that a really interesting case study with kind of like all these different uh, um, agendas, working practice at play. And I think it was a bit of a wake up call in terms of, oh, we can't assume everyone gets it, even though we're all working in the same organisation um, and we all feel passionately about this work, there are different um, agendas, different um, uh, queries, um, different kind of ways of working coming into play and that requires quite a lot of collective organising and um, influencing. So my second case study is um, Lord's Park, which is a really um, amazing um, uh, setting um, on the coast of Carmarthenshire, which until recently was run as a, a dairy farm. Um, it was acquired um, by the Trust in 1983 and I think really importantly um, that was supported with funds raised by the local community in uh, San Stefan. And um, so it was run to, as a dairy farm until recently by um, two um, brothers um, who um, retired, stepped away from the farm in um, during COVID. Um, and I hope it, I'm sure they won't mind me saying that quite elderly and there were health concerns there as well. Um, and they did an amazing job, really well-respected farm. They left the, the dairy absolutely immaculate. Um, so I suppose it, it's signifying a, a kind of point of change in that site's um, evolution over time. 
um, and it's got a very long history um, of hundreds of years. And I think um, uh, because local people um, felt like a real sense of um, ownership and connection um, to the site, um, there were a lot of um, maybe um, concerns about what would happen next um, to the tenancy of, of that site. So there were questions around, um, you know, uh, why, why does it need to change? Can't it continue as a dairy farm? There were also concerns about, you know, whether um, uh, the trust would turn the um, buildings into a holiday cottage um, or whether we'd um, just completely blanket um, plant trees across the fields, which I think are kind of like legitimate um, <laughs> concerns by um, local communities, um, you know, in terms of uh, press coverage of these kind of things can be quite inflammatory um, and a little bit uh, frightening. So um, there were um, also concerns about the state of repair of farm buildings if it was le left empty for too long. And there's also kind of discussions around, you know, uh, what were the special aspects of this place that the community felt really strongly about and its um, sense of um, longevity, its beauty, sense of intimacy, there are footpaths uh, on the site so people kind of like were used to walking there every day to the coastal path. Um, so there's a real sense of kind of like a, a living cultural heritage um, as a, a living working place. So there's, um, uh, there's a strong emotional connection to the site. So we wanted to explore this a little bit more and continue the conversations, continue the dialogue with um, local people. So one of the, obviously one of the reasons why the tenancy of that site will need to change is because of our commitments to um, uh, around climate change um, and supporting niche friendly farming and uh, different use of, uh, of land management. So we really wanted to kind of like have those wider conversations. So um, we developed, um, a pro I wasn't really involved in this aspect of the project so much, but um, uh, there's a project developed with Arts Council of Wales and uh, um, two artists, Lauren Heckler and Alex um, Pavley, um, who uh, Lauren's a Welsh speaking um, artist as well, which was also really important. And she's from the area, from the San Stefan area, so quite well known as well. Um, but we really use that kind of creative process to um, build relationships with local people and um, especially children and local school. And this image is of um, uh, uh, people from the local school, Dem Building at Lord's Park. And there's a lot of activity around kind of like performance, mask making, Den Building, really kind of getting to grips with the site. So there's a lot of sense of kind of community action and conversations and, and a lot of engagement with children and young people. So it feels like it, um, we've managed, I think, to kind of um, reassure people to stay listening. Um, and I think the whole staff team around this project are, are great at doing that. Actually, they've got open ears, open minds about what the future of this site could be. And a lot of um, discussion with local people about the potential for horticulture and um, seasonal activities, local food schemes, um, volunteer conservation works. There's so many possibilities. So uh, um, a tenant hasn't been um, uh, confirmed just yet, but there's a lot of um, building work on the site at the moment. So again, another example of a kind of what seems simple on the surface, but it's so complex and involved and layered and involves a lot of people um, and a lot of um, listening, collective listening. So my third and final case study is the Geller Jones collection, which I mentioned. So really um, amazing collection of over 2000 items of agricultural and domestic machinery collected by Gail Jones, a saddler from Cardigan um, in Kerry Young, and his wife Maya, um, documenting a seismic period of Welsh farming history. As I said, I've got um, Hethwin here on the call with us, so um, she'll be able to answer any questions you may have about it much more than I could. Um, but the collection um, it contains um, th threshing machines, ploughs, shearing machinery and early 20th century tractors alongside domestic items like butter churns, wooden washing machines, vintage vacuum cleaners, etc. And in 1993, the National Heritage Memorial Fund enabled the trust to buy the collection from Geller and Meyer. And, um, I just wanted to kind of like list some of the opportunities and, and, and challenges that kind of like current discussion around uh, the Geller at the moment. Um, 
So I'm sure all these things will be very familiar to you around um, real um, reliance on volunteer support um, to um, maintain, conserve and also interpret um, the collection for visitors and um, so maybe the kind of like pros and cons of that um, reliance on um, a, a volunteer group as well and how, how we um, support our volunteers and make that meaningful for them. I think also kind of like thinking about the collection as a, as a resource for dialogue, especially um, how can we use these amazing objects to talk about what's happening for farming now and maybe to talk about um, farming technology as it continues to change. Um, and a, as a way of connecting with regional farming communities and drawing upon communal knowledge and lived experience of using some of these items, which obviously is kind of like dwindling year by year, unfortunately. And how do we retain some of that um, communal knowledge and um, um, expertise to understand these items more deeply? There's real opportunities for partnership working, and we've been having discussions with groups like. Um, Caradigion Museum, who've been doing some really amazing work in um, connecting with their um, farming communities and representing farming communities through their programming and collections. So obviously the all the ongoing conservation work, um, which a collection like this demands. And I think also the need for collections review, which I, I, um, I don't believe has happened for many years and also um, to be able to understand the significance of the collection more um, holistically. I think um, one of the criticisms that I've heard is, um, you know, um, oh, a lot of the stuff is just in farmer sheds anyway. So that's uh, questioning the significance of some of these items. I don't know enough about it um, to be able to say whether that's true or not. I would, I would question that initially. Um, but I think we need to kind of really um, do um, some more deeper research and to understand it, its significance and, and write a, a significant statement. Um, and also the presentation of the and interpretation of the collection. Um, at the moment, the Gaelic Jones collection feels slightly to the side of um, so the property that's based on is uh, Fanakairon near Aberairon in, in Ceredigion, but it feels slightly separate to the main body of the site. So I think we really need to think about how do we integrate that collection into the site more or think about how the visitors um, are kind of introduced to the collection on site because um, it doesn't have um, uh, a direct connection to um, um but it's housed there. So I think we need to um, make that connection for the visitor a bit more overt. So um, those are my three little case studies which I hope gives a little overview of that kind of like richness and complexity of, of the work of rural, working with rural collections in the trust in Wales. And um, my email address is there, so please do get in touch with thoughts or questions. It'd be good to keep in touch. And I just wanted to end with this rather gorgeous image of a Welsh cob. Um, I'm sure Hethwin will be able to tell me later whether um, this is Seren or Tomos. Um, the two new Welsh cobs in, reintroduced onto the Chiron site during the summer. Um, so their, um, their duties will be um, light grazing on the fields, um, but also um, lots of engagement with our visitors who, and they've settled in really well. And it's amazing to see these animals on site again, and they just bring so much um, life and energy um, to the site and really help us to be able to talk about those ideas of nature friendly farming, grazing and um, alternative land management. So I'm going to end it there and um, stop sharing my screen and we can open up for a conversation.